In you, O Lord, I have taken refuge. Let me never be ashamed. In your righteousness, deliver me and rescue me. Incline your ear to me and save me. Be to me a rock of habitation to which I may continually come. You have given commandment to save me. For you are my rock and my fortress. Isn't that interesting? We were singing all about that. Rescue me, O my God, out of the hand of the wicked, out of the grasp of the wrongdoer and the ruthless man. For you are my hope. O Lord God, you are my confidence from my youth. By you I have been sustained from my birth. You are he who took me from my mother's womb. My praise is continually of you. I have become a marvel to many, for you are my strong refuge. My mouth is filled with your praise and with your glory all day long. Do not cast me off in the time of old age. Do not forsake me when my strength fails, for my enemies have spoken against me, and those who watch for my life have consulted together, saying, God has forsaken him. Pursue and seize them, O God, for there is no one to deliver. O God, do not be far from me. O my God, hasten to my help. Let those who are adversaries of my soul be ashamed and consumed. Let them be covered with reproach and dishonor who seek to injure me. But as for me, verse 14, But as for me, I will hope continually, and I will praise you yet more and more. My mouth shall tell of your righteousness and your salvation all day long, for I do not know uh, the sum of them. I will come with the mighty deeds of the Lord. I will make mention of you, uh, of your righteousness, yours alone. O God, you have taught me from my youth. And I still declare your wondrous deeds. And even when I am old and gray, O God, do not forsake me until I declare your strength to this generation. Father, help us, Lord, this day. This morning I want to share with you that psalm was just so beautiful about, you know, Lord, don't forsake me now. There are people plotting against me. They gather. They, they're saying things about me. They're talking about me at the water cooler. They're, they're, uh, my family's turning against me. I'm written out of the will. All of those things, Lord. All of those things. Don't forsake me now. But the whole crux of what he has said, he talks about how wondrous God has been, sustaining him, keeping him, strengthening him, that God is his refuge throughout his whole life. But I'm going to focus on the very last verse that I read. And even when I am old and gray, O God, do not forsake me until I declare your strength to this generation. I'm not going to ask for a show of hands about how old we all are because I think mine would probably be up the longest, you know, but that's okay. But in our life, we can kind of get consumed with what's going on with us. The beginning of that, that psalm, he really is kind of consumed about the things going around about him, but he's recalling how God has been good to him and how wonderful that is. But at, at that verse, at verse 18... His focus then changes. And I think, not only in this church, but in the church of Jesus Christ as a whole, we have to change the focus of what we're used to. We come to church, we hear the gospel, we hear a preacher preach the gospel, and we come away renewed and convicted and going in the grace of God. But what about the next generation? What are we doing to establish that relationship with God for the next generation? I'm going to go back a little bit. Come on with me to uh, um, to Judges. Let me just find my, my reference. I wrote it down, but I didn't write it in my book. The second chapter in Judges, please. You in Judges? Now, Judges um, uh, talks a little bit more about Joshua. 
in in uh, chapter two, verses uh, six, and so it, it talks about that Joshua has dies. Now remember the story. Joshua picked up Moses' uh, mantle and he took the Israelites into the promised land of Canaan. Remember. So Joshua had the vision, God gave him the strength, and he went through. His vision was different than Moses. I tell this story all the time. It reminds me of the of the salesman who sells shoes and his boss says, I want you to go to this remote village in Africa because we think we're going to open up a shoe store in Africa uh, in this little village, this very primitive village. And so the guy goes uh, to Africa and goes to this very primitive little village and he, and he uh, Western unions his boss and he says, sorry boss, nobody here wears shoes. So the boss sends a second salesman out. The salesman goes to this village and he says, just get an idea what you think. The second salesman, um, uh, uh, Western Union's back to the boss and says, boss, great news, nobody wears shoes. You see, the perception many times dictates our victory in God. So Joshua takes the mantle from Moses. Moses was never going to see or enter the promised land because of his disobedience. He good man. Moses was good, a strong man of faith. He saw miracles. He 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 declared uh, to to Pharaoh the 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 uh, plagues that God was about to bring. He crossed the Red Sea on dry land. He was somebody who saw miracles, and yet when the when uh, he needed to have the most faith. When he needed to do what God had challenged him, he could not bring himself to do it out of fear. Joshua comes up. Joshua, we really don't know much about Joshua. He was kind of hanging around with Moses, you know, doing what he wanted him to do. But he had a vision for what was next. The Lord used Joshua to bring the folks into the promised land. Now, there were a lot of, the, you know, the, the spies had gone into the Israel, the, the uh, Israelites had, uh, had sent ten spies in and they came back talking about, similar about the shoes. Some came back and said, oh man, there are, there are enemies in the land. Others came back and said, man, you should see those grapes. They're this big. Each grape is about the size of a kid's head. Uh, And there's all this wonderful uh, 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 fruits and and green stuff and everything. Oh, yeah, by the way, there are are some tribes that are going to go against you. But God is good. God is gracious. God will, we will see the victory of the Lord. The next generation went in with Joshua, took the land. It doesn't mean that they didn't have battles. There were many battles. But you see, God God had, had gifted Joshua to see past the battle into the promise. In the church today, the question for all of us is what are we doing about the next generation? I had somebody say, why are we spending so much money downstairs? Why, um, why are you doing that? You know, why can't you just use it for storage? You know? Why? Because we need to prepare for the next generation. The Lord is depending on us to bring that faith to the next generation. So Joshua goes into the land and in this chapter, uh, we hear about the death of Joshua. Let me just start at verse number 6. When Joshua had dismissed the people, the sons of Israel uh, went each to his inheritance to possess the land. So once they got into, the, into, the, into Canaan, they were, di- they were divided by tribes, and every tribe went out where they were supposed to go to possess the land. Now these were people of faith. They, they were... They were not part of Moses' group. They were, the, they were the new folks that came up and followed Joshua. So they did what they were supposed to do. They went out to, uh, to possess the land. The people served the Lord all the days uh, of Joshua and all of the days of the elders who survived Joshua, who had seen all the great work that the Lord which he, and which he had done for Israel. So they had first-hand knowledge of what was seen and what was done and the miracles of God. They understood that they came in, they repented, they understood that God restored and and gave them the land. Verse 8, 
Then Joshua, the son of Nun, the servant of the Lord, died at the age of 110. Not bad. And they buried him in the territory of his inheritance in, in Timna Harris, in the hill country of Ephraim, north of Mount Gosh. Now, so far so good. All that generation also were gathered to their fathers and there arose another generation after them who did not know the Lord nor yet the work which he had done for Israel. Even though the parents of those that generation had seen the works of God, even though the elders of that generation had witnessed the, the miraculous taking of this land, that, that they were finally free to inhabit the land that they were called to, they never passed it down. There is such an important premise for us individually and and collectively, corporately as this church. What are we doing to encourage the next generation? First of all, I want to ask you about our own families. I want to challenge us. Are we equipping our kids to walk in the ways of God? Do you know the first thing that kids do is they look to their parents to see are they following the ways of God? Now, all kids go through times of rebellion. All kids go through uh, times of wanting to do their own thing and establishing themselves and all of that. And listen, I understand. I was that kid. My parents raised me up in a certain way. I was like, ha, you know. But I do want to say this, that we have to be mindful, and not just the parents. We here in church, whether we, we think of it or not, we are parents to all of these kids. No, we're not, we're not the final say in anything. But we need to be modeling Christ's life to our kids. Not only here, not only in the home, but outside, when we go to the grocery store, when we're, whatever. What are we doing to bring up the next generation of leaders? We are so blessed in this church. We have a group of young men and some young women that are, that love God, that want to walk in God's ways. Are we establishing a path for them so that they can really walk into the fullness of God? You know, we can, uh, there was a book um, not too long ago. It was probably four or five years uh, ago. It was written by two brothers who were in, in high school. And it was called Do Do the Hard Thing. Do you remember that book, anybody? It's about five years ago, I think, now. And it was about two young teenagers, not young teenagers. One was 16. I think the other one was just out of high school, maybe 18 or 19. And they wrote a book about doing the hard thing. Not the easy thing, not the expected thing, but the hard thing. As a matter of fact, I'm going to get a a bunch of copies uh, for our young people here because I remember reading that book going, wow. And they challenged their generation not to follow the crowd, not to uh, uh, go with the flow, not to do what they felt, but to do the hard thing. And the hard thing was the right thing. It was a powerful book, small book, powerful book, though. We have to present the gospel to the next generation. You know, it's funny. Um, uh, Paul is coming uh, uh, at the end of this month, and uh, um, whenever he shares or whatever, he's so energetic. He wears me out when I'm looking at him. He's like jumping around, hell, you know, all this other stuff. You know, I'm kind of like, okay, let's take this slow and easy. Sort of like, you know, we'll get there, we'll get there. But that ge- the generation of Paul and younger than Paul, where will they find Christ? Where will they know That God loves them and God cares for them. Where is the standard in their lives in a culture that completely is opposed to the teachings of Christ? It's got to come from us. And you know, the scriptures teach that where your heart is, there your treasure is. And so, what are we doing as a church to 
to make sure that our treasure is an investment in the next generation. Go with me now to the New Testament. And we're going to go to uh, 1 Timothy, please. First Timothy four twelve, please. I I wrote uh, I, I circle the the part of the book I wanted to read to you. It says uh, the 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 do the hard thing book. This is how it opens. Most people don't expect you to understand what we're going to tell you in this book. And even if you understand, they don't expect you to care. And even if you care, they don't expect you to do anything about it. And even if you do something about it, they don't expect that it will last. Well, we do an investment in the next generation. All right, so I'm in uh, four, uh, First Timothy, four. What did I say? Twelve. Yeah, four twelve. Now, understand, Timothy um, and Paul. Paul was like a father to Timothy and the Lord. Paul, when you read First and Second Timothy, you're really talk. You're really seeing kind of like a spiritual father to Timothy. Paul instructs Timothy in certain areas. He tells him to watch out for this. Be careful who lays hands upon you. He tells him all different kinds of things to help him in his ministry. Remember, Timothy uh, is going to pastor a church at a relatively young age, and then he says this in chapter four. I'm going to start a little bit, a little bit earlier. He's, uh, uh, in verse, in verse six. Let's go verse six. In pointing out these things to the brethren, Timothy, you will be a good servant of Christ Jesus, constantly nourished on the words of the faith and in the sound doctrine which you have been following. But have nothing to do with worldly fables fit for that old, fit for old women. <laughs> we women always get it. On the other hand, dis- discipline yourself for the purposes of godliness. For bodily discipline is only of little profit, but godliness is profitable for all things, since it holds promise for the present life and also for the life to come. So he's encouraging his son in the Lord. He, he's saying, don't worry about, you know, working out at Planet Fitness. He says, but godliness is profitable for all things. How we submit ourselves to God will profit us in every aspect of our lives. Verse 9. It is a trustworthy statement deserving full acceptance. For it was for this we labor and strive because we have fixed our hope on the living God who is the Savior of all men, especially of believers. Prescribe and teach these things. Let no one look down on your youthfulness, but rather in speech, conduct, love, faith, and purity, show yourselves as an example of those who believe. So he's saying to Timothy, don't let anybody look down on you. In in King James it says, don't despise your youth. And what he's saying to Timothy is not be all pumped up and proud and arrogant. He's not saying that at all. He's saying, but don't allow what people talk about. Let me say it again. (laughs) I preach for a living. I should really be able to speak this line better. Um, He says, don't let people... Belittle what you know is true. That's what he's saying. He's saying, don't let people look down on you because of what you believe. Make sure that you walk according to the truth that you know. Sometimes we just get an idea, well, they're just a kid. Sometimes we just get an idea that that uh, we uh, uh, they'll grow out of it or it's a phase we need to model that kind of discipline in our lives and encourage them to model that discipline always and not only that we sometimes dismiss our youth by saying aren't they cute you know somehow that they don't hear from God I want to tell you something our kids can hear from God just as well as you and I can and maybe sometimes even clearer because we're more concerned about what's going on around us than they are the the key is to have that foundation in them so that when they speak they're speaking from a foundation of godliness 
Now that's what Timothy had. Timothy was a young man, but he had that foundation of godliness that was put in him by his grandmother and his mother, and then by Paul the Apostle, uh, Paul, uh, Saint Paul himself. Timothy had that grounding. So now he grows up in the admonition of the Lord and he's ready to assume godly duties. God pulls him out and says, you're going to be a pastor of this church in Ephesus. And, and that's exactly what happens to Timothy. But he still listens to the voice of Paul because he doesn't have it all yet, but he wants it all. Do you understand? Oh, that we would have that heart in our lives, huh? You know, even as we talked about forgiveness and repentance before communion, w- wouldn't that be wonderful for us as adults to say, I don't have it all yet, Lord, teach me. Sometimes, you know, the older I get, I have to say that more often because I go, I don't get this and I should get it by now, Lord, but I'm still falling in this area. That thing in our heart that brings us back to the Lord and humbles ourselves you know, if we teach that to our kids, if, we, if our kids see that modeling, that becomes part of their lives. He says, Let no one look down on your youthfulness, but rather, in speech, conduct, love, faith, and purity, show yourself an example. So he's saying to them, Listen, don't take on other people's problem with you. But by your example, young Timothy, walk as an example. Walk as a, as a, an image of Christ. By your words, by your work, by your, the way you walk, the way you talk, in your humility, all of those things. Walk as an example. But you know what? I don't think it's just with Timothy. I think it's with me. I think it's with us. That we walk as an example. Some people say, well, I've only been a Christian five years. And so that's somehow an, ex- an excuse not to follow the Lord. I want to tell you something. If a person's heart is for Jesus, if a person is ready and willing to follow God, we will grow so fast you can't even believe it. But we get, as we get older, sometimes we get into ruts. We think the Lord wouldn't talk this way or the Lord would, wouldn't want us to wear jeans to church or the Lord has another uh, way of dealing with us. You know, um, uh, I've been with Christians who uh, think that the only, the only uh, correct uh, translation of the scriptures is one. There's only one correct translation. And I want to say, you know what? You're following the edicts of man. And not of God. You see, right now, I've put off talking about this uh, for about three weeks. But right now, there's a situation going on in the Catholic Church. Have you known about this? Uh, The Pope, Francis, uh, in an interview, a, a, a newspaper interview... He's, the reporter said, and this is a very liberal Italian newspaper, the reporter said to the Pope, uh, Your Holiness, um, you can't believe that there's really a hell. And the Pope said, When you die, that's it. If you're good, you go to heaven. But if you're bad, that's it. Now I want to tell you something. That has rocked the church. Right now, people don't know what to believe. We need to stand for the truth of Christ. We need to know what we believe and teach it to our kids and their kids. And after that, we just keep teaching it. Because there is such a vacuum of truth. My heart breaks for the Catholics right now. My heart breaks that their leader would deny one of the very tenets of the Apostles' Creed. Every Sunday, the Catholics say the Apostles' Creed. I believe in heaven and hell. And yet the Pope has denied it. We believe. That's right. We believe. I bring that up. I'm praying for the the Catholic Church right now. Because when the head of that church denies the truth that's in, in for centuries, what they believed in, we're in trouble. But 
my point in even bringing it up today is saying there is an opportunity now to mirror the example of Christ so strongly. You know, I believe that we're in the last days. I do believe that Jesus is coming again. Uh, maybe in, maybe not in my lifetime, but certainly maybe in yours. That Jesus is coming again. Things are in place. There's uh, a, a, a dismantling of people's faith. Those people that believe solely in the authority of one person and, and without the knowledge of the word of God, how will they know if we don't bring it to them? How will our children know? We just assume that they'll get it by osmosis because they come to church with us or they go to a Christian school or they do this or they do that. No, we can't assume that. We have to give them the truth of the gospel every day. Now, on the other side of that is that we have to realize that God is calling people much younger than we are to missions work, to becoming an elder and a deacon in the the household of God as a pastor. Do you know, at Elam, they have Elam uh, Bible Church up there, and... Their senior pastor is Josh Finley. Josh Finley did an internship at uh, Church of the Living God in Manchester. And I was looking for a youth pastor, and he called. He was looking for to be a youth pastor here. This was a matter of about eight years ago or nine years ago. And, uh, and I said to him, uh, Josh, thank you, but I want you to pray about it, because I only want you here if God wants you here. And... And I wasn't feeling, I mean, we needed one, but I wasn't really feeling that this was the guy anyway. He called me back later and he said, no, I'm sorry, Pastor, I didn't mean to waste your time, but I really think the Lord wants me to hold off. And I said, I do too, Josh. You go with God. He is now the lead pastor. He's in his mid-twenties, maybe now mid to late twenties, of Elam Gospel Church. They have over a thousand people in their congregation. Now, I have to say that it's a step of faith to follow a youthful leader like that. Because, guess what? They make mistakes. Guess what? I do too. (laughs) Guess what? Every pastor makes mistakes. You know, we're so blessed in this church because even uh, I feel the love of God that, that even if I mess up, if, I, if I'm if i not caring enough for someone or if I, I forgot to call them or I didn't do what I should have done, that there's grace here. There, there's always been grace here for me. But I mean, we still need to understand that even in our youth, we can't be fearful. We have God on our side. God will direct our path. I, you know, so we follow the Lord, we encourage our young people, we, we walk as an example and encourage them to be an example. And we'll wait till you see what God does. Whether we're talking about this particular church or the church of Jesus Christ. Paul knew that with Timothy when he said, don't despise your youth. Don't let people talk down to you about your faith. Your faith is solid. You know, I think sometimes what happens, we have said to people, oh, you're just on a honeymoon when you first come into the Lord and we're like, ooh, yippee, yay, yay. God loves me. Jesus loves me. You know, when I was first saved, I was practicing for the, uh, for the rapture. I would be jumping up and saying, my friends and I said, let's practice in case Jesus comes. Let's practice how we're going to jump when the, when the, when the rapture comes and he meets us in the air. And so we kind of poo-poo that kind of exuberance and say, oh, they're on a honeymoon with the Lord. Wait till the first trial comes. And what we do is we belittle the grace of God to get us through those trials. I must admit, I still once in a while jump up just in case Jesus wants to come back. I want to be ready. I want to look good. You know, one leg up in the air like this, you know. Let's encourage those around us. Let's encourage our kids in this church. There are kids in our church that are called by God. They don't know it yet and they actually don't even show it yet. But they're called by Almighty God. Let's encourage them. Let's let's let God work in their lives. Jesus said, when the kids wanted to come and the apostles were kind of keeping them away. He said, what are you doing? Let the kids come. That's why it's so important for downstairs. 
That's why it's so important that we continually have Sunday school, even if there's one or two kids here or there's a whole group of kids here. We will continually put into our kids' lives. It's one of the most important things we can do is to prepare for the next generation. Even if you don't think so, our children look to us. They, they, they see us. They hear us when we think we're by ourselves. The Lord wants us to raise our youth up. And I want to say to those young people, you, you young men and, and young ladies in this church, that it's time you rose up. It's time you rose up. That's one of the things that we're trying to do. Daniel is now uh, on a call to worship team and and, uh, uh, some of the other young folks have been doing it for a long time. But I want you to rise up and take your position in the church. There's somebody here who's going to be an elder or a deacon or who knows, maybe a pastor. And I want to encourage you always Don't despise the youth. Let them grow. They will make mistakes as we all make mistakes. But let's encourage them in their gifting. Amen? Amen. Amen. Thank you, church. Father, we um, we just love you, Lord. And Father, we ask, Lord, for an abundance of young people here. Father, all uh, focusing on, on you, Lord, that they would be ready to take their position as you call them, Lord. Father, open our eyes to see the giftings that you have given our young people. Encourage those giftings, Lord. And Father, we just thank you, Almighty God. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen.